Welcome to Electron Online, and our next video is a very interesting one. It talks about the energy being carried by a wave. Now, even though that seems like a little side topic that most of us may not be interested in, it's really the primary thing that waves do. They carry energy. It, you can think about sound waves or electromagnetic waves or waves on a string or ocean waves. All they do is carry energy from point A to point B. So we should be able to figure out the energy carried by a wave, and let's start with relatively simple case where we carry where we calculate the energy carried by a wave on a string so the way you want to look at it is here we have a wave of course the wave energy travels to the right and let's say for example and let's take a small little piece on the string and as that piece on the string moves up and down it experiences two kinds of energies one it experiences kinetic energy because it's moving up and down and of course kinetic energy is one half mv squared so we take a small amount of mass and uh, its velocity squared out times one half when we have the energy of that particular piece on the string. At the same time, the string also experiences tension, and the tension constantly changes um, because sometimes the the string is uh, ch changed in shape, and thus that causes increased tension, and it goes back to its equilibrium point, that's decreased tension. So the change in the tension causes work to need, that needs to be performed, and that work then results in existing potential energy, just kind of like stretching a spring. So what we're going to do here is we're going to find the energy on a string, and we're going to do that by summing up the kinetic energy and the potential energy. So let's begin with the relatively easy one, which is the kinetic energy. Remember that kinetic energy is equal to uh, one-half mv squared, and so the kinetic energy of that little piece, let's call it d kinetic energy, for a very small amount of kinetic energy, is equal to one-half times dm times v squared, and of course v is in the y direction, in the perpendicular, this is not the velocity of the wave, this is the velocity of a particle on the string that stays in the x position but moves up and down. All right, since we have the displacement as a function of x and t right here, we can find the velocity in the y direction by taking the derivative of that. So we can say that the velocity in the y direction is equal to the d dt of the position y, which is equal to d dt of the equation a times the cosine of kx minus omega t, and when we take the derivative of that with respect to time, notice that x will be constant, only t will vary, and so this is equal to the derivative of the cosine is the uh, negative sine, so this is a times the negative sine of kx minus omega t times the derivative of the angle, which in this case would be minus omega, and so when we multiply all this together, we can say that v in the y direction is equal to, uh, the negatives will cancel out, we get a times omega times the sine of kx minus omega t. Now that's the velocity in the y direction, so if we square that and multiply that times dm and times one half, we have the kinetic energy contained within a small little piece of string. Now we still need to figure out what dm is. Now notice that uh, we have a length of string, the string has mass per unit length, mu. So if we multiply mu times the length, which is dx, we should get dm. So in other words, dm can be expressed as the mass per unit length times the piece of length that we're considering, which is dx. And so we have to plug that into our equation. So finally, we can say that the d kinetic energy, a small amount of kinetic energy provided by a small piece on the string, oscillating up and down with velocity v, is equal to one half times dm, which is mu times dx, times velocity in the y direction squared, which is this right here, which gives us a squared omega squared times the sine squared of kx minus omega t. And of course, if we now want to express that in terms of the energy per unit length, we divide both sides by dx, so we can say that the d dx of the kinetic energy, which means the amount of kinetic energy per dx portion of the string, can be expressed as one half mu a squared omega squared times the sine squared of kx minus omega t. All right, so now we have 
the first portion of our equation, we have the kinetic energy contained within the wave. Now we need to find the potential energy contained within the wave. And that is done slightly different. Okay, to be able to visualize the potential energy gained by the string, we need to look at it slightly different. So let's imagine here that we have a string that was firstly hor first horizontal, and now because of the wave motion, the string gets stretched into a curved shape like that. And of course, if we take a small enough section, if we call this dx, and then on one end of the string, we lifted a small amount of dy like that. Now notice this is the arc length. We call this a small amount of ds section like that. But notice that for small pieces, the, the um, what we call the hypotenuse of this triangle is very similar to ds. So we can probably approximate ds by simply saying that's equal to the hypotenuse of this triangle. So what we can say is that uh, ds squared is equal to dx squared plus dy squared. All right, now where's all this going? Well, what happened is that we had the, um, the string this long before and we had a certain amount of tension on the string and now by a wave coming through there we actually stretch the string we're going to do a small amount of work by stretching it let's call delta equal the amount of the stretched amount so this is the stretched amount of the string so how much work did we do well the work that we do the small amount of dw is equal when we take the small amount of string it's equal to the force on the string which is the tension and multiply it times the displacement, which would be the delta right there, the amount, of, amount that we strength. So force times distance would be the work that we did. And of course, the work that we did would be the potential energy put into that segment on the string. Now the delta is going to be what it is now minus what it was before. So it's going to be ds minus dx. So this is going to be the tension times ds minus dx and of course we know that ds is really equal to the square root of the dx squared plus dy squared so we can write this as this is equal to the tension times instead of ds we're going to write this as the square root of uh, dx squared min uh, not minus but plus dy squared and I'm going to subtract from that a dx all right so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to factor out a dx. So when we do that, we say, okay, this is equal to, when we factor out dx, we have t times dx times, now of course, I factor out a dx here, that becomes a one because it's underneath the radical, so that'd be the square root of one minus, when I factor out a dx here, I will get a dy over dx quantity squared, and I factor out a dx there, I get a minus one. Close the parentheses there. All right, what in the world are we doing? Well, now what we need to do is we need to find the dy dx and plug it in there. And since we know what dy, what y is, a dy dx should be easily found by taking the square root. So, uh, not the square root, but taking the derivative. Uh, so we can say that uh, dy is equal to the derivative of that. Uh, well, we want to take it with respect to x. So derivative with respect to x, so that means x is a variable, omega is not. So that gives us uh, a times the minus sine of kx minus omega t times the derivative of the angle, which in this case would be k. So that means that this would be equal to uh, a minus ka times the sine of kx minus omega t. Now we want to square that and insert that in over here. All right? The reason why we wrote it like this, the reason why we factor out a dx is because we want to get this format in. Now there's a neat mathematical trick. Now a neat mathematical trick says that we have the square root of one plus or minus a very small amount, let's say epsilon, very small amount. This can now be approximated by one plus or minus one half the epsilon. That gets rid of the radical. And for very small values like dy dx, that is perfectly legal. So we can now write this as this is equal to t times dx times the quantity 1 minus, because it's a minus here, 1 half times dy dx squared minus 1. And notice, beautifully, this one and this one cancels out. And now we're stuck with, or 
I shouldn't say stuck with, because it's a good thing. We're left with, this is equal to minus one half t dx times the quantity dy dx squared. And now we can go back and look over here because we found the dy dx, uh, not squared, but we found dy dx, we squared that, and we'll get that value right there. So when we plug that in, this is equal to uh, minus one half times t times dx, and this quantity right here squared will become k squared a squared times the sine squared of kx minus omega t. And remember, that is the work done to stretch the string from this position to this position, which is the same as saying I put that amount of potential energy into the system. Now the question also is, why the minus? Well, the minus comes in because you're working with a spring, and so actually the equation is uh, that the force is equal to minus kx because it's a reactionary force that kind of takes care of the negative, so we don't have to worry about the negative. This is actually a positive amount of potential energy that we put into the spring, so we can actually get rid of the negative and call it potential energy added to the spring that was work done against the spring. That's why the negative came in. So now we have, let's see, we should have the kinetic energy right here and now we have the potential energy of course we can take the dx here and put it over here so this is the amount of potential energy in the spring per small unit length dx and that's this quantity right here and now we all have to do is add those two together and that gives us the energy per dx on a spring both the potential and the kinetic energy so where is the equation right here? So we take the equation right here, we can write the dE dx, the total energy is equal to the sum of the potential and the kinetic energy. Now notice some of the similarities in the equation. They both have a sine squared kx minus omega t, sine squared kx minus omega t, they both have an a squared, they both have a one half, but this one has a mu omega squared and this one has a t k squared. And remember, with the t and the mu, there's some relationship there between the velocity and, of course, with, um, with a, uh, I'm sorry, with omega and k, there's a relationship there with frequency and wavelength. We'll see that in just a moment. But let's first put them in here. So we get one half mu a squared omega squared sine squared of kx minus omega t and we add to that, that's the kinetic energy portion. Now we add the potential energy portion, which is one half T K squared A squared times the sine squared of KX minus omega T. All right, now I'm going to factor out everything that's common. The one half is common, the A squared is common, the sine squared is common. And so that leaves us with, uh, what? Uh, let's see here. Uh, I'm, I'm actually, yeah, we'll do it like this. One half a squared sine squared of kx minus omega t. That's all that's common. What's left here is the mu in omega squared plus t times the k squared. Now, can we find a way to combine these right here? So now we have to have some relationships. I'm running out of board space here, so just to make it clear, I'm going to use a different color so it's easier to see. But what I want to do, I think, is I want to convert t and k to omega and mu. So, what are some of the relationships between t and mu? We have the equation here that says that the velocity is equal to the square root of the tension divided by mu. So, if I want to convert from t to mu, I have to solve this for t. I'm going to square both sides. So that means v squared is equal to t divided by mu. And so that means that t is equal to v squared times mu. All right. So I can replace this t by v squared times mu. Now, what's v squared? Well, v squared is frequency times wavelength. So I can say that the tension is equal to frequency squared times wavelength squared times mu. All right? And then I have k squared right here. Remember, k is the wave number. So I can say that k is equal to 2 pi over lambda. So k squared is equal to 2 pi squared divided by lambda squared. All right, if I now go ahead and replace k squared and t by what this and this is equal to, 
I'll go ahead and then use one more separate color. So I can then say that t times k squared can be written as frequency squared times wavelength squared times mu and multiply it times 2 pi quantity squared divided by wavelength squared. Now notice that the wavelengths cancel out. And now we have f squared times 2 pi squared. Now 2 pi f, that's omega, that's the angular frequency. So this can now be written as the angular frequency squared times mu, which is exactly the same that we have over there. So this can now be replaced by omega squared times mu. So now we have two of those, and those two multiply times this one half. The one half disappears, and finally we can say that the amount of energy per unit length on the string is equal to one half times two of those, gives me one of those, which is mu omega squared a squared times the sine squared of kx minus omega t. And that's how we find the energy per unit length in the string. Now notice that's going to be a function of both position and time. That means it changes constantly. So depending upon where you are, you're going to have potential energy or no potential energy. You're going to have kinetic energy or no kinetic energy. Notice when the string is at its equilibrium point, there's no potential energy because the string didn't stretch any additional distance. But at that point, the velocity is at a maximum. So that means that the string is moving at its maximum velocity up and down. When you get to the very top of the string, the velocity at that point is zero, but then you have the maximum stretch of the string, so you have maximum potential energy. So you can see that the energy contained within any stretch of string is always a sum of the potential and kinetic energy. Together, they form a single function, and that's what it looks like. Pretty amazing. Now, for most of you, you may say, oh, I don't care about that. That looks way too complicated. But it does give you a kind of a, a really nice insight into how energy is transported across a string. And you can see how it's really possible to calculate what that is. Now, on our next video, we're going to show you an example to actually calculate the energy on, the, on a string. So we're just going to go ahead and use the equation and see how it's applied. So it's a lot easier than when you see it applied. Okay, that's how you do that.